Hey, it's Cliff and people have been asking when it comes to the Corium blockchain, is this just another layer one? Why should I care about this? There's so many layer one tokens being created. Why should I care about Corium? And I feel like the developers on Corium have released a paper to allow you to make a decision on if you feel that it is something different. Is it something special or is it not? So I'm going to bring up that technical paper so we can review it together and see if there's really any big differences between the Corium blockchain or Solana or any other layer one that you really want to think of. So first, I want to bring up the definition of a layer one blockchain so that we're all on the same page. So I got a article that I pulled from MoonPay, not affiliated with them in any way. It's just I thought they had a really good definition. So it says, what is a layer one blockchain? A layer one blockchain is a base level of blockchain architecture. Layer one blockchains validate and execute transactions without support from another network and reimburses transaction fees with cryptocurrencies. So you could think of that as say like your house. Your house is your layer one blockchain. That's where you are able to sleep. You go there, you cook and you are able to go to the restroom. Whatever you need to do is all based on this layer one blockchain that is surrounding your life, right? You can kind of think of yourself as the tokens that support the layer one blockchain to do the different utilities that you want to do on the blockchain. So say you want to go to work, you are the token that is initiating the utility to go to work to provide you money or whatever you need to do. Now, it's kind of important to understand that this kind of gets a little bit more complicated when you think about interoperability between the different blockchains, but you could kind of think of that like you going over to your friend's house, which is their layer one blockchain, and maybe you go over there and you're cooking or you're using the restroom or whatever you got to do over there. They kind of work together and that's the way cryptocurrency is going forward. So anyway, let's look at this technical white paper. So here it is, and I will post a link to this down below so you can go ahead and check it out. It's around six or seven pages, so it's not too long where they kind of go into this. It is labeled smart tokens, a highly customizable and cost effective solution to tokenize complex fungible and non fungible and hybrid tokens on the blockchain. So they spent a lot of this paper talking about Ethereum, which is our main layer one when people think about layer ones and how they offer smart contracts and things of that sort. So I'm not going to go through that because most people already know what that is. What we're really concerned about when it comes to Quarium is how are they going to improve on that? Should I be investing in Quarium or should I just be putting my money into Ethereum, right? Because Ethereum is already well established. They're already doing smart contracts and things of the sort. So what is Quarium actually bringing to the table? So what they're doing differently is they're offering something called smart tokens. So let me pull up the definition here. It's on page two if you want to find it. It says smart tokens are natively issued tokens on the Corium chain that are wrapped around smart contracts. They are highly customizable and are designed to be lightweight and flexible while retaining extendability. So you can think of it like uh, Corium's a layer one, but if you want to build on top of it with your own token, this is what you'll be using to make those tokens. So let's say we want Cliff token. Cliff token is going to be a layer two on our layer one, which is Corium. And further down, it says these tokens exist on the chain storage and memory. Hence, interacting with them does not require calling smart contract functions. We can refer to smart tokens as objects and classes that inherit a set of characteristics and functions from the global definition of a token. All tokens have a set of features that are known to the chain. Developers can extend the set of provided functionality and add non-deterministic smart contract-like functions to achieve greater flexibility when developing specific use cases into a token. Regardless of their type, all tokens share common functions such as minting, sending, burning, and so on. The list of default function is picked from the real use cases of the current DeFi systems. And as the chain progresses, this list will expand to support more features. So they're looking to add in more things that these certain tokens can do as they're created or whatever is needed. But as of right now, it says currently the following set of features is available for all smart tokens. So you have your issuance, which is going to be minting things like uh, you want to have Cliff token do NFTs. We can have that on there with the token. They have the 
access control list known as the ACL. So there's gonna be certain parameters that these tokens can do things. There's burning if you want to slowly burn the supply, freezing if there was a case that you needed to freeze your tokens before they went somewhere else or while they were somewhere whitelisting i think most people know that from like whitelisting addresses you would just uh, program in a address that it could go somewhere and then it's allowed to go there blacklisting is just the opposite of that that's saying don't ever send to this address ibc which is inner blockchain communication compatibility that's mostly known from Cosmos Chain. So that's just showing that they're going to be functional together. Like I was saying, you going over to your friend's house, this is the same as core token going over to the Cosmos blockchain and, and using their features like their water, that kind of stuff. Smart contract integration. So that's just using smart contracts. So this is talking about, say we wanna make Cliff Token go live. It says upon token issuance, the issuer must configure the behavior of the token and set specific flags that will determine which functions can be triggered at a later stage. These flags are set using ACL, that's our access control list, and are as follows. So this is just you setting flags for what your tokens are able to do. As we said before, burn mint, whitelist, blacklist, partial freeze, global freeze, send, uh, IBCs, things like that. So you are just programming what you want these tokens to do. These flags remain immutable after token issuance and cannot be changed at a later stage. Depending on the token type, these flags can be used to customize what assets need to be represented by the token. For example, is it a stable coin? Is it a cryptocurrency? Is it for an NFT? Is this going to be used for stocks? Is it CBDCs? You know, what, what do we need this token to do and what functions that we have available do you want to be programmed into the token? So once you get the token set up, it says once a token is issued and depending on the flags, network participants such as the issuers or users can interact with these tokens using the features provided. It is imperative to understand the importance of natively issued tokens and default functions in terms of speed, cost efficiency, predictability, and security, and extendability. So from there, it goes into certain functions that are supposed to make these tokens even better on this specific blockchain. So it says speed. As mentioned earlier, calling functions of smart contracts can be tricky as they rely on the parent smart contract execution, which is unknown. However, natively issued tokens are predictable and the code execution is known to the chain. This makes transactions such as sending smart tokens much faster with smart tokens. So just to summarize that, just because you have the limitations put into the token, it doesn't need to recall from the smart contract. It can just kind of do what it does and what it knows how to do already, which makes the uh, process go a little bit faster. So number two, cost efficiency. Interacting with smart tokens costs much less than interacting with smart contracts. The fees are always set according to a known computational complexity. These transactions are no longer dependent on the amount of gas offered by the caller, but rather are fixed, resulting in a more robust and predictable interaction in management. When fees are always known, users such as institutions, governments, and other DeFi applications can predict how to handle batches of transactions. In addition, the Corian blockchain offers a discount for bulk transactions and submissions similar to software as a service based APIs work with a fee per API call and usage. So they're saying if you want to bundle your transactions in bulk, there will be a reduced fee for you to use for utilizing the network. But not only that, there is a fixed fee for when you're actually using the network for the, your singular transactions. So I imagine the point would be to bring the cost down. I mean, it's, it's similar to like XRP. When people think XRP, they're thinking low cost on the network, but Corium potentially will have more functionality. So we're just gonna have to sit back and kind of see what happens with it. Predictability, when execution time, cost, and responses are known for a transaction, users can develop a much more robust, bug-free, and stable application. Responses from the chain, whether successful or unsuccessful, are known and can be handled properly by the developers. Okay, security. One of the main aspects of issuing tokens natively on the Corian blockchain is security. When using smart contracts, the developer must audit the code of the contract to ensure there are no security vulnerabilities. Over the past few years, hundreds of exploits have been found and abused in smart contracts resulting in billions of dollars of losses to operators and users. 
smart tokens are not prone to these exploits because the code is known to be the same for all tokens on the chain. Obviously, if the code is not changing, it's much easier to audit a code that does not change ever, but it actually gets a little bit better from there. The code for the main implementation is audited several times as open by the public as open source code to be inspected and audited. So if it's open source code, everybody can look at the code and see that the code is legit. There's not gonna be any holes in the code. Although an extension to the smart token, which comes in the form of a smart contract must still be audited by the user, but the majority of the current use cases on the blockchain, such as fungible tokens and basic NFTs remain risk-free. Extendability, smart tokens can be exposed to smart contracts for for greater customization. Other than the basic features such as sending coins and minting which are provided by the chain by default, the smart contract functions attachment can be defined a set of new logic and features for a token. And then they give examples if this isn't making sense to you. So for example, one can develop dividend functions in a token that represent shares of a company. So if you got a stock, you can issue other tokens aside from that that operate as a dividend for your stock. Pretty cool if you ask me. Or an NFT can be extended to become interactive with the owner such as an NFT that can act like a game. Okay, I'm not I'm not big on NFTs and games, but you know, it's kind of cool that they could add functionalities into the NFTs. Since Quorum uses Wasm as its smart contract engine, developers can easily port and add functionalities developed in several languages and attach them to their digital assets. So there's a lot of creative utility that can be used because they're using Wasm. So you scroll down, it gives you kind of a visual representation if it's not making sense to you. So that, you have your functions that are going to be in token, let's say Cliff token, Cliff token wants all of these functions in here. They wanna be able to send the token, uh, mint the token, burn the token, whitelist it, whatever you need to do, whatever functionality that Cliff token is gonna have is gonna be built into the token. And then you're going to define what kind of token is it? Is it gonna be a crypto? Is it gonna be a stable coin? Is it gonna be an NFT? You know, what? what is the purpose of this token? And then it's, you extend that out to smart contracts to do whatever function that you need it to do. And then lastly, at the bottom here, they just kind of spell out the features that they already have defined. So you have issuance where they're setting up the, the features that are gonna be on the token as I just mentioned and then you scroll up and it talks about minting that can be put in there so you have minting so this feature would be useful for cbd stable coin tokenized security wrapped cryptos and whatever you needed to do again this is your token so you got to kind of decide what you want to do with it so you move into c you have your acls which could be this defining your administrator you know this this is going to be for freezing this is your minting or burning for d we have burning when this feature is enabled on a token then the holders of the token who have the right permissions will be able to burn some of the token they hold to reduce the total supply of that token so if you want the ability to be able to burn the tokens you can put that into your token if you want as well. It gives an example of burning, which would be if shares of a company are tokenized, then the total supply will represent the total shares of the company on the chain, right? If you have shares on a chain that you have a total supply and it says, and burning those tokens would mean that those shares are now moved out of the blockchain and total supplies will correctly represent that fact. So if you burn the shares, they're gone. They're out of here, gotta go. There's the last page here, which has freezing for E. It says freezing allows the administrator of the token to freeze a portion or a balance of the token held by a user. There are many use cases that are enforced by law to freeze a token. An example use case is when the token administrator sends tokens to an address but does not want the user to spend them until some time has passed, such as clearing a check. We have whitelisting, which we kind of went over. So due to KYC or any other policy enforced by the issuer, smart tokens might be held by a limited scope of accounts that pass the verification procedure. Its possible use cases include token representing stock shares, CBDCs, or any other rights enforced by a legal system where the identity of the holder must be confirmed. Uh, blacklisting. This feature might be helpful in situations when a investigation is ongoing. The token holder who is suspected of money laundering, fraud, terroristic 
financing, et cetera. In those cases, an account might be blocked until results are collected. Makes sense. They have IBC, which again is what I talked about being interoperable with the Cosmos chain and going there and do, doing whatever they need to do on that separate layer one, again, going to your friend's house. And so these are the features that are currently being built into the Corium blockchain. Now you get to take this technical paper and the information that we're looking at here and you get to decide, is this better than Cardano? Is this where I should be putting my money? Are there other layer ones that are better? Is it Solana? Is it Bitcoin? Is it whatever you want? Who is actually having the most utility and who is going to be used the most to make you the most money? Because that's ultimately what we're looking at here is more utility, more money is going to be in this protocol and the price is going to go up, right? So things they're working on are pretty common features from what I've seen in this paper. In this paper, uh, they're trying to make it faster and all the features like whitelisting, blacklisting, things like that are, are their common features. The way they're setting them up though are hopefully to the advantage of Corium. And then also once they have this as the baseline in place and they can add more features into those tokens as they're issued, like they were saying, they, your token is flagged with certain characteristics. Well, hopefully they will have more of those flags that will create the utility that we want. We want to be innovative so people are actually using Corium. So again, you take the information, you get to decide, is it worth it? I'm not going to tell you either way, but I would like to hear what you think about this down in the comments. So please let me know what you think about Corium smart tokens and Corium layer one as general. Anyway, thank you to my Patreon supporter, Kevin. And as always, thank you for watching.